Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome back for those that were joining us on the um, fixed income. Oh no, sorry for our equities um, uh, webinar earlier this morning. Uh, so welcome to our fixed income one uh, for April 2021. Uh, for those of you who haven't been or joined us on our calls before, my name is Jonathan Wu. I am the executive director, co-founder, uh, and um, chief investment specialist for the Premium China Funds Group. So let's get started. Uh, standard disclaimer. Um, and uh, for those of you that haven't yet registered, please register for our roadshow. Uh, you will get an email um, post the end of this webinar. Uh, and then what you'll be able to see is there's a link that you can do the registration. For those of you who are in Sydney, please join us for our, uh, our lunch um, with our head of um, the China Fund and the Asia Fund presenting, as well as Gordon Yip, who's the CIO of the Fixed Income Team and Portfolio Manager of the Premium Asia Income Fund, which is what you are guys uh, are listening to today. Um, CPD points uh, will be awarded whether or not you are live at the venue in Sydney or on the live stream. So please uh, register for that. Um, and if you are in Sydney, it will be a great chance to come see you in person. In terms of platform availability for the pre major income fund, it's on all the major platforms. Please let us know if there's one of them that's not available that you would like it on. Please speak to your BDM, either myself uh, or with Derek for our friends over in New Zealand on the call today. Um, this fund is available both on Aegis as well as FNZ. So looking at um, our risk versus opportunities chart that I put up each month, um, what I want to highlight this month is what you see here in yellow, uh, lack of proper research in emerging market bonds. Um, and probably for the first time in a couple of months, um, there's been a very interesting uh, risk and I guess also opportunity, pardon the pun based on the slide, uh, of um, how our fundamental DNA of how we invest in the bond market for your investors fundamentally differs from everybody else and what problems that causes for existing bond managers in this space or in bonds overall. Um, because fundamentally, as you know, the DNA of the pre-major income fund is that we ignore research ratings um, by um, all houses, whether that be Asian research houses or Western research houses like Fitch Moody's and SMP. Um, and that gives us the opportunity to open up the, the investment universe to be far wider um, than what most people um, can perceive. And while 10 years ago we had the same aim of uh, building a portfolio that will pay you 6% a, uh, a year in income, looked less attractive then, looks extremely attractive today. And our DNA, our strategy, our track record, and how we approach the world of uh, corporate debt has not changed uh, whatsoever. So recapping, um, our team in Hong Kong via Value Partners managing about 13 billion USD under management of which 4 billion of that is fixed income uh, and 9 billion of that is equities. We have an investment team of over 70 men and women on the ground, uh, which is critical uh, going forward in terms of um, finding the added value of why you're paying for an active manager. So for those of you on the call today who have seen me before, have met me before, uh, I'm still a financial advisor today. So I review and do DD on fund managers every day of the week as well. And going forward, how do the fees justify the, the means to an end, whereby you actually use a strategy for a client portfolio? You have to be able to articulate that very, very clearly. Um, and that's something that we've been able to do and therefore why um, with that, with regards especially to our Asian income fund, the fund growth has been exceptionally strong um, and we've been added to a number of model portfolios. Um, so for those of you that are still interested in adding it to the models, um, certainly reach out and have a chat and then we're gonna have a chat about how um, our strategy blends well with the rest of what you have in fixed income. What's also important here to note is that management and co-founders or value partners still own around 43% of the company's equity, which is critical to have that alignment of interest uh, with you. It's not fly-by-night manager, set up in 1993, so we're talking about um, a very, very extended track record um, over a period of time, almost 30 years in fact. 
So in terms of our experience in Conet team, uh, obviously the fixed income team do spend a lot of time with the equities team as well, sharing research, insights uh, and whatnot. And what you can see here at the bottom is Gordon um, is the portfolio manager for the fund and Elaine is the 2IC um, for our strategy, spending um, a very extended period of time with value partners. So what we're trying to do, as I said, the DNA of whether or not we're trying to invest for equities or for fixed income for your clients is that we are trying to find the best way to skin a cat. And we believe that the best way to skin that cat is to go and go bottom up. Okay? We're not a macro manager, not at all. We're trying to find the best investment ideas uh, for your investors. And that's why for us, uh, it's about the company visits. And last year, our team did over 8,000 uh, company visits, and these are excluding brokers and whatnot. And that's through COVID, because one of the great things uh, throughout COVID is for North Asia, uh, the economy's opened up a lot quicker, growth came back, the optics over around company earnings, cash flows became far more uh, cognizant to our team, and therefore allowing us to feel comfortable investing in, in the bond market. Um, and that's paid uh, in spades uh, over 2021 for your clients. So we have a very big team um, looking after fixed income. This is the broader team here. Um, we've got specific uh, portfolio management teams, business management teams, as well as research and strategy purely around that fixed income side, inclusive of a deal lawyer in the case of Alvin So. And what we're trying to then build out is that our strategy is trying to find a raft of bonds, whether that be sovereign debt or, um, or corporate debt, uh, all in hard currency being US dollars, because we, we don't want to be in a situation where there may be certain months or certain quarters where we underperform and we have to come back to you and say, oh, sorry, it's because of currency. Okay, or it's because of some other factor. And when you run strategies with too many sleeves or too many variables, and sometimes as a manager, you really have to stick to your guns in terms of what you are good at, what you are fundamentally good at in your DNA, we are, by nature, fundamental investors, looking for debt that's undervalued. So right now, fixed income is fundamentally a big problem for investors, not only because of the yield, but also because of the market price. Okay. So while rates are at zero, and we all know that we are literally have passed the end. So this is not a question of we are, um, we are approaching the end. We are now past the end of the 40 year bull market rally in bonds. Okay. And what we've seen is that advisors are struggling to comprehend that because um, how do you add value and in fixed income going forward for investors if the only way forward is actually losing money? Um, do you then say to your clients, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll put more in aggressive equities because I still have to have this bucket of bonds for you. I basically guarantee you'll lose money on it, um, but hopefully the equities will be enough to offset that loss. Okay. Or do you go and find alternative strategies that are not intrinsically linked with interest rates, um, not intrinsically linked with uh, duration risk, um, and not intrinsically risk linked with research house risk, which I'm going to talk through in a minute because it's, that is the topic of the month. Um, how do you then add value? Um, so we're looking for bonds that are paying over 6%. And, and so our screening universe is around 1200 bonds, 450 issuers. We then take that and then dilute it down to something that's more manageable. It's somewhere between 800 to 1000 bonds or 300 issuers that you see below here. Then we do that bottom up credit analysis for three to 400 bonds. Okay. And fundamentally, we, we do take into account what is the underlying risk um, of the ability for us to get our money back. That, that, that's that's the binary outcome when you play in debt, okay? Am I gonna get my money back or do I get nothing back? Okay. Very zero and one. So for us, when we're looking at that fundamental question of whether or not we're gonna get our money back, we are looking at the underlying cash flows of the company. So I always use this example to say, um, to, to explain what we are and what we aren't comfortable with. If a company comes to us and they're a fisherman or they're, they're, they're fishermen, fisherwomen, um, and they run a fisheries business, and we say, what is your ability to pay back capital when it comes full due? And their response is, oh, we've got the cash flows, but even if we went down, we'll give you a fish. Now, I don't mean that as a joke. I'm literally, that is a live example that we have where a company thinks that they could basically give us fish as collateral, which is impossible. 
Whereas if you verse that against a um, real estate company, well, there's independently verifiable values for real estate, whether that be land or the building on top of the land, there are independently verifiable third party valuations, which gives us a lot more comfort in terms of how much, how much money is being lent to this company in terms of their bond and our ability to get our capital back. So we run bottom up credit analysis in around three to 400 ish uh, bonds and 200 issuers, and then we construct a portfolio. And that construct portfolio is, is has a much longer tail compared to our equity funds because it's fixed income. We wanna be a bit more defensive or conservative from that basis. This just goes through what we do um, and probably the key thing and, and why we have our great, our fantastic insights where we don't just take a Moody's rating is that we actually meet with the companies upstream and downstream. Okay, so that's here, as well as the peers to ensure the accuracy of the information. And that's critical to our, our analysis. We don't care what the benchmarks do and things like that. So we then plug that all into our scorecard system and then it spits out a score for us. And if it's above four, then it's part of our investment universe. If it's less than four, uh, it doesn't appear as part of our universe. So you can cover that more into detail. Um, you'll get the slides after this anyhow. So the fundamental challenge, as I said, is it's, it's no longer how do we actually get yield for our clients? The question is, how do we not lose money for our clients in fixed income, which is the fundamental challenge going forward? Now, this goes into the topic of the week, uh, sorry, topic of the month. Okay, So if anyone's uh, been reading the press around Chinese debt, fantastic case in point of what we have. So this is, a, this is the article that City Morning Herald wrote um, last week. Red lights flashing in China as Huarong plunges uh, Stokes market contagion fears. Okay, and I was interviewed on Ausbiz about this exact topic um, last Friday. Um, now, the the fundamental issue that we have here, and for those of you that don't or have not heard of Huarong, Huarong is a debt financing company. It's about 55% owned by the Ministry of Finance uh, in China. It is a state-owned enterprise, okay? So it's through and through, it's an SOE. And what's happened is that um, Huarong was, and alongside two other debt restructuring companies, were born out of the Asian financial crisis in, uh, in 1997, 98. These companies were built by the Chinese central government in order to absorb bad debt in the system. Uh, and uh, over time, they built up debt books and they themselves as a company also issued debt. And that's the problem. So uh, last week or earlier last week, the company announced that they will not release their uh, financial results to the public um, because they're a listed company in actual fact. Uh, and the auditor has held off their issuing their, uh, their report uh, because of a pending transaction. When you're a company that's fundamentally invested in debt restructuring, that is another word for bad debt. Okay. And then the company itself that does the restructuring goes and issues debt on their own company, which is focused on bad debts. Does this remind everyone of a story in 2007 and 2008 where debt was restructured that was bad debt, RMBS, restructured by another company and then diversified and then made it look like it's a great debt. So this is Huarong. It's an SOE. So people put two and two together and say, well, if you're an SOE, the government guarantees you. That's not true. Okay. Now there's a fundamental range of problems that flow on the back of that, which I'm gonna go through in the next couple of slides but it goes to the heart again, to the DNA um, of our investment philosophy, which is we don't, we don't believe in implicit guarantees. We look at explicit guarantees. And if it's not in the contract, we can't assume anything. So needless to say, this is a group that we've basically ignored um, or not invested in and basically, you know, we couldn't get a far, as far away from this as, as, as possible. And um, the question fundamentally that has arisen out of this is, do SOEs always have the guarantee of their respective governments? 
because it's 55% owned by um, Ministry of Finance, about 20% owned by the State Council, which is the highest administrative body inside China? The answer is no. There, there are three bonds uh, that have been issued by Huarong. One's a perpetual bond, uh, one is a bond that is during in 2022 and one in 2025. So the basic rules around debt, the closer you are to, um, to maturity, uh, the closer it is to $100, assuming that everything's all hunky-dory. But what you see here is that the perpetual bond, the 4.5% uh, dollar bond, these are all in US dollars, by the way, so this is the market that we do participate in, um, has fallen to about $50. Uh, and then furthermore, um, you can see the bond uh, that's due literally next year has also fallen to about 68. And then the bond that's due in about four years time has fallen to about $62. Now, for those of you that have a good understanding of the bond market, for bonds to fall this much, this fast, is a problem is a fundamental problem because if you consider these three bonds have consistently traded above par that's one reason why we wouldn't buy it anyway but second of all these debts are actually investment grade debt to the major research houses we took a snapshot out of Bloom, our bloomberg screen and this is the rating now Moody's has it at A3, Standard & Poor's has it at triple, triple B+, plus. Fitch have it at A. What does that mean? That means it's investment grade. There's a problem here, isn't there? An investment grade debt, even if we took into account COVID last March, where mark to market values of bonds plunged through the floor, in that month where effectively Lehman Brothers occurred in 30 days type scenario where there was no liquidity in the market, an investment grade debt can't lose half its value in two weeks. It simply can't. Now, subsequent to this, the, the prices have recovered a little bit, not because there's any more clarity, it's just that because it's fallen by half, people go, well, this, this looks a bit interesting. We don't find it interesting, by the way. Okay, we think there are many special situations which we think that we have good insights and good transparency and therefore comfort in knowing that when comes due, we will get the dollar back for you as well as to collect the coupons along the way. But in this particular case, we are not even remotely confident that this may happen. Okay, um, And there's going to be a lot of restructuring going on. There's some talk that the Chinese government's going to come in and ship off the bad parts of the debt and put into another listed entity overseas. That does, still doesn't make it particularly good for the bondholders, right? You're probably going to have to take a haircut. And that's the thing that we're trying to avoid. And, and pleasingly, through the 10-year, almost 10-year, sorry, nine-year and seven-month track record of the strategy, we have never uh, lost a dollar of capital uh, of investors. Okay simply because we are that careful in not just reading into research ratings because we don't care about research ratings. And this perpetually is the problem because if I show you the next slide, this is the part that's gonna scare everybody. Who are the major investors in this investment grade Chinese government backed SOE? BlackRock, Goldman Sachs, China Asset Management Company, Allianz and HSBC are top five. We're talking about a lot of debt. We're talking 37 billion US dollars worth of debt that's being held by these guys. It's the who's who of fixed income investment, uh, fixed income investing, right? Most US investment banks, most US private equity firms, most other global European insurance companies are holding investment grade debt, which just fell through the floor by half. And remember, insurance companies and most bond managers have to insert, uh, invest conservatively. What is the definition of that conservatism? Invest in investment grade debt only. But this is the outcome investment grade debt. Even after the value fell by half, the ratings have not changed. So if you still had some hope 
that research houses actually change their ways after the GFC, you are fundamentally kidding yourself that you can trust that. And again, even notwithstanding this very, very point example I'm giving you this afternoon, is that where, why does every fund manager ha have access to the same body of research and they invest based on that body of research? What is the value add? Are you trading your way through the debt? Are you investing in the debt for the pure income? Because if that's the case, then you are the same with everybody else. So an index option seems to be much better. But is it? Here are the numbers for the index options ending March versus us. So as an advisor, you will sell your client the thought process that will get you 2.98% yield in government bonds in Australia and 1.47% for global developed market government bonds. But then you have this other side that people are not talking to investors about. And this is the fundamental problem. Do we invest in bonds, tell our clients that we're basically guaranteeing you a capital loss, uh, and then we hope that the equity side offsets it? Now, these are index options because this is what most people invest in. We're saying that in the next seven years, in the case of Aussie government bonds, and in the case of global bonds, 10 years, that you will lose about 1% and about one and two thirds percent per annum which then imputes that right now, if you buy these portfolios, you're paying $111 and then telling your clients in 6.7 years, I'll guarantee you get about hundred bucks back. Okay. Now this situation is very normal, but it's not something that I think that clients are going to be accepting. What we're saying is that we're going to offer you at, at 7.32% in terms of cash yield with an average capital gain per year of about 0.74%. Okay, So we're buying at those bonds at $97 each on average. Okay. Why do I want to buy something more than $100? Well, knowing that the binary outcome, assuming that the cash flows come true and the principal gets paid back, that I'm only going to get $100. So I'm going to effectively lose 10% on both of these investments. Why would I do that? Then furthermore, there are correlation benefits of investing in USD to so dollar bonds, Asia high yield. Because if you're investing in either European high yield or in um, US high yield, you've actually got a high correlation to, to equities. And so what we've, what we've come up with is that we're investing in something that's about 0.1 lower in terms of the correlation to equities, but anything left Obviously, you want something that's negatively correlated or very close to zero. Even local Asia looks pretty good. Okay, it has a correlation of less than 0.2 against global equities, but you have to take on the currency risk. Okay? In the future, we may consider um, the, the currency more so in China if we see an arbitrage opportunity, but right now it is all dollar denominated debt, which ensures that you have the highest level of liquidity. And throughout even COVID, when we stress test the portfolio within an inch of its life, we could still liquefy 100% of the portfolio in a day. That's how well managed on a day-to-day -day basis the strategy is. If it wasn't for this, we wouldn't be investing $5 million of our family money in this strategy. Okay. So if you look at our performance ending March, obviously as part of the rest of the world, fixed income did have a correction um, and we were down about 0.44%, nothing that we're concerned about at all. And what you can see here is that our portfolio characteristics wise, again, focusing on ensuring that cash yield is lower than the yield to maturity, not the other way around, not the other way around. And so coming up to sort of um, nine years and seven months worth of track record, we've generated you know, over nine and a half percent net of fees, as well as a volatility of less than 600 basis points, where fundamentally our volatility target is somewhere between six to 700 um, basis points over the long term. And it's been a very, very stable return line for investors. In terms of geographical exposure, where we're sitting at the moment, um, you can see here that again, just like our equities portfolio, we're trying to invest in places where we have optics over cash flows. 
Okay, um, there's no particular deliberate skew. We have reduced even further and further diversified out the portfolio away from real estate, not because we don't like it, but because again, March provided us with another sort of minor correction that allowed us to get into the market. Because a month ago, if I sort of go back a slide, um, our time to maturity was about 2.7 years from memory. And now that's been brought back all the way to about 1.9. So we're trying to bring that, that maturity profile in tighter um, and get a better diversification of debt across other sectors where you can see transport materials um, and utilities added together is about the other 40% of our portfolio and the rest is sort of a longer tail. Um, you can also see here that the cash um, is at zero and that's because this is these are figures ending 31 March where we paid out our next 1.5% um, uh, distribution quarterly distribution to investors. Again, um, uh, uh, clients have been very, very happy with that. Um, and so that's how our sector split is occurring at the moment. Uh, an update on our distribution profile for the last three years. As I said, this fund targets a 1.5% distribution per quarter. Um, and then it, there, there sometimes is, and I stress this, there is sometimes a bullet at the end of the Australian financial year, which is 30 June. That's why you see a six here. That's why you see a 1.6 here. That's why you see a two here. And then in the me in the meantime, the first three quarters, uh, we aim to pay out one and a half percent. We now have 39 observable periods, observable quarterly periods, um, since the start of the fund, never failed to pay a distribution. Okay. Uh, sorry. Not only that, never failed to pay a distribution of less than one and a half percent per quarter. So the consistency of income for us is our bread and butter, right? We are, we just are not going to put that at risk, let alone the capital value, which is why, again, that trusted sort of source of income for us going forward, how are you going to generate? And then furthermore, how do you communicate that with clients? If we then look at the 10 year track record and an advisor um, last week was very, very um, intelligent to ask me this question is, this is 10 years worth of track record. Um, 10 years ago, the risk-free rate was uh, a lot higher. And so this is the total return of the main funds that uh, advisors use. And this is total return. Okay, We're not talking about huge levels of volatility overall. Remember that global equities, as a general rule of thumb, runs at a volatility of about 15%. We're talking about anything between the band of about you know, 2% all the way to 6%, it's not a very, very wide brand of volatility we're talking about, okay? Yet this is total return of both the income as well as the capital gain generated from a portfolio of bonds. And so for us, what we're trying to do is we, we are trying to be the line of best fit. So if you consider a line of best fit from the bottom left here across all these dots, we sit on the left-hand side of that, which means that we're taking fundamentally lower level of risk to generate the return for you. If we then consider what is the best time periods for us, I mean, we don't need to talk about that because everyone knows how how, how strongly the, the fund can perform. Let's look at the worst. The worst period is COVID. Worst three months, 6.4%, but the worst three years, 4.2% total return net of fees. And that again is covering off that, um, that COVID period. Worst performing ever three years in its almost 10 year history. Then if we look at the consistency of that performance against our peer group, so our peer group is uh, global high yield, um, the benchmark by Morningstar, and again, this is just Morningstar's data, uh, is they use they benchmark us against Barco's global high yield total return hedged back into Australian dollars. And what you can see here is that our we always shoot the lights out. Now, what's changed is you look at the year to date and the one year and you go, oh, that doesn't look so great, Jonathan. You're, I mean, you're talking about consistency of returns. Well, that's right. The reason why is when you consider the time period, the time period is 12 months ending March. What does that mean? That means the, the one year period started on the 1st of April, 2020. Remember what happened in April, 2020 with most of the developed market bond funds, the high yield bond funds, they bounced really hard. Why? Because in the previous month, they all lost 15%. In March last year, we only lost 7.3%, right? In 100% high yield. There were hybrid funds that were made up of investment grade and high yield debt in March of 2020 that lost 10%. We only lost 7.3%. And so obviously the bounce back for us in April of 2020 wasn't going to be anywhere near as high. Again, 
one year numbers can be very skewed. So when you actually look at how that blends over time, three years, five years, we are better than the top quartile is the point that we're trying to uh, put forward here. Okay, so the consistency of performance and in about three months time, we'll be able to see what that looks like for 10 years and you can probably guess where we're going to sit in, in terms of that quartile as well. What furthermore has happened is when we compare ourselves, again, the Morningstar data showing against Barclays Global High Yield Total Return, our upside capture, which means when the index goes up, what is the percentage of times that we beat the index? It's 90% of the time. And then our downside capture represents when the Barclays index goes down, what's the percentage of times that we actually do worse than Barclays? 32% of the time. So you want to be as high up, but as far to the left as possible. And this is a is a very, very good um, balance uh, in terms of that, in, in terms of in terms of where we sit there. So that's all I want to talk about today. Um, Again, if you have any questions, please reach out to us. You see that there's also a question box there um, if you wanted to send uh, a question box through and then I'm happy to either answer it now or take it offline. As I said, what we're trying to do is talk you through the fact that bonds is a very different investment uh, thesis to equities and you have to be very, very careful that the previous track record of how the total return of a bond fund is calculated and how that is delivered to you depends on the market dynamic okay and for us we're not concerned about that dynamic because our fundamental dna doesn't require interest rate movements for us to make money okay and there are very very rare strategies where that occurs so you are paying active fees for an incredibly superior performance um, and what we're offering, as I said, is on major platforms, direct investment, uh, and we're also currently ex uh, looking down the path of multi-distributed ETFs or what most advisors like to refer to as ASX quoted funds. So please watch this space. Um, please reach out to me and Derek, um, uh, for those of you in Australia, please reach out to Clayton, uh, for those of you that are across the ditch today, uh, and we'd love to have a chat to see how we can add value and also give you some ideas about how to blend fixed income products uh, to achieve an optimal outcome, because that's exactly what we're doing each day for our advice clients. So with that, uh, I'm two minutes over time, but thank you very much for your time. I wish everyone a, um, a wonderful afternoon. Uh, we will not have webinars next month because it's going to be very close to our roadshow on the 1st of June, and we will also um, skip over having, uh, having webinars in July. So we'll be back, I'll be back doing these from about August um, this year. So have a good, every, uh, have a good afternoon, everybody.